can you see something? Yes, we can. Oh, lovely. Okay, that's that's a good. Um, let me get the pointer out, and then we can finally start. Okay, okay, I'm ready. Let's let's do this. Lovely. That's great. And, okay, so hello everyone. After a little of delay, um, thanks a lot for the nice introduction as well, and thanks for inviting me to present our recent work on the defect-dependent corrugation in graphene, which was published recently in uh, Nano Letters, where we basically focus on how defects change the morphology. And I will start, however, with an idealized picture we usually have in mind, because when we usually think of graphene, we imagine it of something like this, like a flat surface comprised of hexagons. And the point is, in reality, this is not really the case, because the finer temperature we have is corrugation, these intrinsic ripples propagating through the sheet, and we also might have some, some various kinds of defects present. And this can range from um, individual atoms being removed, bonds being rotated or so, to even more complex defects such as uh, grain boundaries. And just to give you a flavor uh, how extreme that can get, um, here's like a TM image of graphene where you can see everything what is not colored in this light gray um, is corresponds to like an impurity and imperfection and this makes up up to 40 percent so we need to take this into account when we deal with graphene and real applications um the point is like you know their names suggest somehow they are something bad but this is not necessarily the case and we can actually make use of defects and ripples because they strongly affect the properties and material behavior and we can impose them on the material on purpose to control and tail and tune the the, the behavior and over the last couple of years, there have been well, there has been like so much progress on how to tune and how to kind of change and modify the atomic structure of graphene that this is now really possible on a very precise level. Also, with like you know all this at hand, um, of course there are a lot of like applications where you can really make use of these wrinkles and and defects because, for example, they change the and enhance the chemical activity of of, of the substrate, and therefore they are really um, good candidates for absorption of organic pollutants, uh, for hydrogen storage, uh, or for catalysis, just to name a few. And to push basically the um, application side forward and really make this structurally modified graphene a good candidate for these applications, we really need to understand how defects and wrinkles affect each other and like how we can basically nano engineer this problem backwards. And this is what this talk is mainly about between the coupling between defects and ripples. And we mainly focus on three important and very fundamental questions which haven't been answered yet in the literature. And the first one is basically how does the impact of a defect vary across different types? So we are focusing on two different, very specific and very simple defects, um, which is one like the die vacancy where you just remove two atoms and then you get a, a defect corresponding, you know, here in this uh, orange color. Um, and the other one is the stone waste defect, so we just rotated one carbon carbon bond. Um, so you see, it's very, very simple how we kind of approach this. We will compare that to, to uh, pristine graphene. And of course, we will then increase the defect concentration and see what we can observe and try to understand any mechanisms we observe. And to do all of this, what we employ are molecular dynamic simulations. And the reason for this is, this is for this specific problem at hand, where we want to understand how defects change the morphology on a nano scale, we can basically observe that at our computer screen. And Therefore, molecular dynamic solutions are a very good tool to do this. The point is with any methodology you use, of course, there are bottlenecks. And in, in case of molecular dynamic simulations, it's the force field. So basically the description of the interatomic interactions, in our case, the carbon-carbon interaction. And um, what we employ here to kind of model this is a natural learning-based force field. And that sounds all very fancy and so on. It was developed in our in our group like a year ago. But what it basically is, it's just like fitted to a huge database of of initial data, so of like quantum mechanical reference calculations. And this potential really covers an entire phase space almost of, of carbon. And to kind of visualize this, um, here's just like an overview of a few of these of these structures included in the training set, ranging from like graphite shown here, nanotubes, uh, fullerenes, amorphous carbon, to even, you know, of course, defective graphene, pristine graphene, and so on. And basically, the high accuracy of the reference method, as well as this kind of large training set, sure that in the evaluation they found that we get very high accuracy for relevant properties for our work which includes the formation energies of defects the defect structure itself phonons which are basically just like the vibrations which we are interested in when studying ripples so we're quite confident that we can get reliable results out of our simulations 
And before I can show you the, 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 the first set of results, we need to talk about how we can actually quantify the morphology, how can we express this as one scalar value ideally. And for this sake, we introduced the corrugation amplification factor, short CAF, and where we measure the atomic out of place and displacements of our graphene sheet in our simulation. And these are just some snapshots, and you will see this kind of color coded um, representation quite often today, where the atoms are colored according to their height or according to the out of plane displacement, and it's like two different scales. What we basically do then is we just compute the standard deviation over all atoms and average that, and then we can basically get a rough idea how scattered the atoms are, and that gives us a good idea of the corrugation. And because we're interested in like relative values rather than absolute values, we express everything relative to the pristine case. And so we can basically, for each system, for each defect concentration, for each type, we can compute a CAF. And now let's have a look how this basically resolves and what we find. So here I plot the um, CAF as a function of the defect concentrations. And I already kind of show here this line corresponds to the pristine case always at one naturally. To remind us what that looks like, another nice snapshot, colored according to the out of plane displacements. So where we now introduce defects um, shown here in for the store waste defect, we can see that at the highest concentrations ranging here to 3%, um, we can get a CF of three, which corresponds then to a threefold enhancement of the corrugation itself. And we can also see this in this snapshot here, which is way more structured, way more wrinkled than the pristine case. By the way, each of these markers correspond to uh, one initial like orientation and spatial arrangement of the defect. So we also make sure that this is not dependent on, on, on like how we kind of randomly assign them on the sheet. What's interesting is then when we introduce die vacancies instead of those waste defects, we find that this can become even more significant, this kind of morphological transformation, where you can reach an increasement of or an enhancement of the corrugation of up to like 500% for high concentrations. And this is also shown here where you can see this is really completely different from this pristine case. What's also interesting um, is that you don't really need a lot of defects to reach a high corrugation in your system. Even if you stay at like concentrations of like 0.2% or so, you already can kind of like push the, the morphology to a limit or like to kind of um, getting really wrinkled and so on. And we thought, okay, this is all interesting, but we really want to stand it like better. And where's this difference coming from between the defects and how is this concentration dependence playing a role and so on? So what we did is we started analyzing the geometry of the defects in the local environments. And for this, basically, just like the procedure works as follows. We kind of take one of our simulation, our simulation, we take one frame um, and we identify the defects shown here in, in, in red. We then zoom in or have a close up look at the uh, atoms forming this local environment or in the neighborhood. And then we compute two geometric parameters. And the first one is the inclination, which is just the norm of the gradient. And you can imagine that like how much is this environment tilted or how like how steep is it basically? And this is shown here. And the other thing is the Gaussian curvature, which is a bit more complicated. And like just to remind you, this is basically the product of the principal curvatures in your system. And that can take a value of zero if one of the curvatures to zero, um, but it can also, you know, for sphere with positive and for this kind of Pringle shape when you have two opposite signs for your, for your curvature, then that, um, yeah, is basically smaller than zero. So if this is hand, this is a good tool to kind of evaluate like the, the origin of this kind of like corrugation enhancement. And when we kind of like plot this now, again, I, I show the um, everything as a function of the defect concentration. And at the top, we see the inclination. At the bottom, we see the Gaussian curvature. And um, I start again with the pristine sheet because this is our reference and we can see for the Gaussian curvature, this is always zero, um, which is kind of expected. And these intrinsic ripples at finite temperature can be completely attributed to the um, local inclination, which is the final value. To also visualize how like local environments look like and what is kind of a um, representative shape of this kind of environment, we, we show here a snapshot where this kind of green uh, surface corresponds to the local environment, which is an average flat in case of the inclination. So basically, if we now look again at the defect starting as the whales again, we see, well, it's not that different for the looking just at the, cur at the curvature. So it's like it's not really bending the defect itself. Um, and we can see that this high corrugation we observe is also just induced by the ability of the defect to bend to that this shape shown here, basically just to tilt. And this kind of agrees well with like previous uh, quantum mechanical calculations. What's also interesting is that um, 
we observed that yes, there is like a small increase at the beginning, but overall it's relatively small. And this kind of suggests that it's the waste defects, like while intrinsically tilted, it doesn't really increase with increasing concentration. So there's only weak interaction coupling between multiple defects on the graphene sheet. If you compare this to the dye vacancies, this is a completely different picture because starting at the curvature again, um, we can see, first of all, it's not zero, but it was a final value for, for um, an isolated defect and going, it can increase by order of magnitude if you go to high concentration. And it's always negative, which corresponds to this kind of Pringles shape shown here because they have opposite signs. And this is quite interesting because also for the inclination, we see this is quite going from basically pristine case for an isolated defect to um, the Stowe Wales reference value. So and this is basically probably induced by the um, high corrugation, high curvature, basically forcing the defect first to bend and then also to kind of tilt. And yeah, so basically what that tells us, okay, die vacancies, first of all, are able to bend, but they also really strongly interact and couple with each other. And this is all interesting because now we see that although both defects introduce high corrugation, um, the mechanisms behind this are very different. And that could even suggest a richer variety if we look at like different defects. Um, and that could give us an ability to kind of tune the sheet even more efficiently in the future. And before I conclude everything I discussed today, let me give you a quick outlook where we look at like something else, because so far everything was concerned regarding the, the structure and morphology. But what's also very interesting, it's very important for applications as well, are the dynamics of the ripples. And that's why I'm quickly showing three short videos. First for the pristine case, and again, everything is colored according to the atomic heights. And we can see like in the pristine case, we have this random rippling, like fluid-like motion of these kind of waves propagating through the sheet. If we then look what happens if we introduce a large number of defects shown here for 1% die vacancies, and then let that run as well. We have a high corrugation, way more corrugated system, but like, the, like we have static rippling. There's no propagation anymore. The system is frozen. There was like a class-like phase transition, if you want. And this is already interesting because that would suggest, okay, corrugation means like ripples die, if you, if, you know, like formulating it drastically. But then we can also compare that with our previous work where we looked at like what happens if you compress graphene, then you get these very nicely shapes here. And that's also just the corrugation. But if you do that like on a global level, so just like applying unilateral strain, you observe that the um, ripples still move and they don't move randomly, they move coherently. And so, yeah, this is all quite interesting and could be interesting for some applications. And I can talk about that more later, but I think I'm running out of time a bit. So just to conclude um, what I told today. So basically, first of all, what you should take home is that defects can significantly increase the corrugation in graphene. Um, the magnitude depends on the concentration and the defect type. And the reason for this is that they're like different driving forces, inclination and curvature, which depend on the nature of the defect, which are present and also on the ability of them to interact and couple with each other. And the last thing I will say is basically that this could be all very interesting. And this is a bit blue skies, but I still want to show it is that we can think about like water diffusion on like nanofluidic devices on like uh, pristine graphene, this is all very random, but we could think about using defects to basically tailor and have like a static rippling to kind of like form channels um, where we have kind of like defect mediated directed flux of water molecules on the nanoscale. All blue skies, but we're thinking about this currently, so stay tuned. Okay, then last thing really uh, is yeah, I would like to thank all the co-authors, of course, my supervisors, uh, a lot of people we had discussions with. The resources, the Sargent Center, of course, for inviting me, organizing this event, and you for your attention. Thank you.